2016, after the election, uh, I read a letter to America that was in terrain.org that Allison had written. Um, and, you know, I was in that place of just not knowing what to do. And in Allison's letter at the end, she said that whatever you do, um, do not be silent. And I kept thinking about that, not just for myself, what it meant not to be silent, but what could we do uh, with the summer program, with the Fine Arts Work Center, to create um, possibilities for, for all of us not to be silent. Then Allison, who is a former Work Center fellow, uh, she was here in 1984, came to the Work Center that spring and met with me to talk about what could we do? What would the possibilities be? And it was um, the genesis of Social Justice Week. And we ran that week for three summers, um, three life-changing weeks. Um, Masha Gessen came, uh, uh, Irma Shivaid, Javier Zamora, um, then COVID. So for two years, we haven't met, we haven't been in person. Um, and last spring, uh, Pam Houston came to visit, and she also had been a former faculty in Social Justice Week. And we sat down to think about, you know, what could, what, you know, the world has changed in these two years. Um, what could Social Justice Week look like? And we wanted to have a focus on climate change, on ecology. Um, so I brought these ideas to Allison as well, and um, we concocted <laughs> Ecology and, um, and Justice Week. And I'm so honored to have Allison here tonight. She's never been here for Social Justice Week, but she is the inspiration and the catalyst uh, and the champion of this important week. So Allison Hawthorne Deming is a poet, essayist, and teacher former Agnes Nelms Hari, Chair in Environment and Social Justice, and currently Regents Professor Emerita in Creative Writing at the University of Arizona. Deming grew up in Connecticut and is a great-granddaughter of Nathaniel Hawthorne. Her books include A Woven World on Fashion, Fisherman and the Sardine Dress, Stairway to Heaven, Death Valley, Painted Light, Zoologies on Animals and the Human Spirit, Science and Other Poems, The Monarchs, A Poem Sequence, The Edges of the Civilized World, Writing the Sacred into the Real, and many others. She edited Poetry of the American West, a Columbia anthology, and co-edited co -edited with Laurette E. Savoy, The Colors of Nature, Essays on Culture, Identity, and the Natural World. I'd also like to say that her letter to America inspired hundreds of letters to terrain.org, and it became an anthology. Hers is the first in the anthology, published by Trinity University Press. Deming's honors include a Guggenheim Fellowship, Wallace Stegner Fellowship, Fine Arts Work Center Fellowship, and two fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. Please join me in welcoming Allison Hawthorne Deming. Thank you for that wonderful intro, very touching to me. Yeah, you see, you write something, you never know what's going to happen, but I think that's the point, is you write something in the hopes that it affects people, and sometimes it just spurs them to get their words on the page as well, and what could be better than that? So I wrote something for you tonight. Uh, this is a collaged essay, it's a kind of like a Robert Rauschenberg combine, if you know his wonderful works. where. You know, there's a tire and a goat and <laughs> some paint and God knows what else. I don't have a tire or a goat. But um, uh, hopefully this will give you plenty to ruminate on for uh, the week. Ten takes on ecology and justice. Number one. One night, sleeping in my small studio in the north, 
tucked into a stand of black spruce and tamarack trees. I woke to hear a woman scream outside my window. I jumped up and looked into the dark, nothing but trees. Should I turn on the light? As I dithered in confusion, there's no house in sight from my island home where a few thousand people make their living on the sea. Cod and haddock mostly fished out, same for halibut. Lobsters in a heyday, thanks to climate change, waters warm to the south of the Canadian Maritimes, so the lobsters have moved north. The fishers hitting them as hard as they can until they move on to Newfoundland. It will mean a few years of new pickup trucks and then payments no one can afford. That's to be expected, the rhythms of a place where nature and culture have been closely interwoven for two centuries, where nature sets the terms for cultural change. But I would not expect to hear a woman scream in the night in my woodlot, only the lap lap of gentle waves licking the rocky shore, or a testosterone fueled pickup truck peeling out on the asphalt. I flicked on the porch light, the scream lifted. I could see the sound rising, track its trajectory of flight into the darker woods. The scream grew softer and softer as it rose, then silence. That's when the tumblers fell into place as if I were a burglar cracking a safe. I knew that when a rabbit screams, it can sound like a woman. That always seemed far-fetched, creature that small and timid, crying out with such force. But this was the only explanation that made sense to me. A barred owl had fixed eyes on the rabbit from its perch in a tall spruce, dove down to make the grab, adjust its grip, and when my light came on, carry its prey for safer dining into the dark woods. The balance of nature, predator and prey. The scream jolted me, those moments of animal terror and suffering. Then the awful silence I felt for the rabbit, and yet the owl's survival, its satisfaction and prowess dwelled in that silence. On balance, the exchange seemed just. As it seems just to me, when my island neighbors shoot a deer from those overpopulating our woods and fill their freezers for the winter. It used to bother me when I learned my neighbor builds a tree stand and spreads wild apples beneath it to lure the herd. Was baiting a deer a fair fight? I'm just going to shoot one, my neighbor explained, asking if he could gather the apples that had fallen in my yard. I fatten up the rest to get them through the winter. Fair enough, I thought. Two, jump cut to the paintings of George Catlin, made during his eight years of travel in the 1830s among tribes in the American West. A lawyer turned painter and writer, he visited a total of 55 different tribes intent on preserving images of Native American culture. In Buffalo Bulls in a Wallow, he painted the herd drifting like a shape-shifting cloud across the prairie, a few bulls tussling, in the foreground, a bull luxuriates in the wallow he has dug, described lyrically in Catlin's 1841 letters and notes. The enormous bull lowered down upon one knee will plunge his horns and at last his head up, driving up the earth and soon making an excavation in the ground into which the water filters from amongst the grass, forming for him in a few moments a cool and comfortable bath into which he plunges like a hog in his mire. This goes on and on. It's an amazing description. It's in the, it's in the um, Norton Book of Nature Writing, I think, the George Catlin bit on the bison. He understood how the bison's behavior changed the landscape, debunking stories about fairy circles in the grasslands. Close by the wallow, he painted two grassy circles, perimeters marked with taller weeds, where a healed over wallow had been. Nothing magic about this willowy geometry, rather evidence of how creatures shape the landscape in which they live. From the vantage of our century, dominated by the diminishment of the animal world, Catlin's paintings and writing are aesthetic treasures documenting an abundance long gone. Long gone. Catlin's buffalo hunt is an action shot. Three Sioux hunters, somewhat eroticized, Mounted on horseback, bare-chested, feather-crested, at full gallop with arrows drawn, pursue three galloping bison among the herd 
that flows through the prairie grass, a celebration of the vigor and the symbiotic relationship between the Sioux and the bison. Three hunters against the boundless herd, again, seems like a fair fight, or in Robin Wall Kimmerer's for formulation, a just harvest. Jump cut to 40 years later. By the early 1870s, a very different imagistic palette had emerged. Photographs document bison pelts stacked high as houses and in a rare historic photo, a mountain of bison skulls stacked up to the height of four or five men. One man stands at the base, another perches at the summit. They look absurdly small, mere toys in juxtaposition to the devastation they are surely there to celebrate. An estimated 30 million bison once roamed the Great Plains. By the end of the 19th century, a few hundred remained in the wild. It's easy to fall into the misanthropic swoon, all too familiar in our time of extremity, human avarice and violence running roughshod over the creation. But a quick dip into the internet pool tells a very different story. In his 2016 piece in The Atlantic, Weston Fepin reports on the U.S. Army's support of hunting trips for East Coast elites. The government supplied an army escort, wagons carrying cooks and linens and china and carpeted tents and a traveling ice house to keep the hunter's wine chilled. One, one colonel told a wealthy hunter from New York after he had killed 30 bulls, kill every buffalo you can, every buffalo dead is an Indian fawn. Official government policy, starve the Native Americans to force them off the plains and onto reservations. The slaughter of the American bison was a key element in an official government policy of genocide and cultural erasure. Environment and justice equally defiled. A symbiotic relationship weaponized to serve the project of usurping the land. When I began thinking about this talk, the idea of personhood was foremost in my mind. I'd been moved to learn of the global indigenous-led campaign for the rights of nature. The Wanganua River in New Zealand, the third longest in the country, was the first in the world to be recognized as an indivisible and living being and granted personhood in 2017 by an act of parliament. In Maori legal tradition, humans and nature are kin. The river is ancestor and spiritual authority. I encountered this world during my time teaching with a for a semester in Hawaii. I had the opportunity to take a hike with the Huilama hiking club from Kamehameha High School, the school dedicated to educating children of native Hawaiian descent. Before the hike, we all gathered in a circle and the leader told us we should listen to the sounds of the birds and wind when we entered the forest and we would be with the ancestors. One of the students led a prayer asking permission for us to go into the forest and for us to go safely. That sense of respectful belonging marks a long lineage of Pacific Islander understanding that our human ancestry is embodied in the landscape. The Magpie River, sacred to Innu First Nation in northern Quebec, is the first river in Canada to be granted legal personhood. The Klamath River, traditional homeland of the Uruk tribe, has gained legal status to stave off the threats of dams, development, and farm runoff. Lake Erie was granted legal rights in 2019 after an algal bloom shut down city water for three days. Within autumn homelands on and beyond the U.S.-Mexico border in Arizona, a movement has arisen to protect saguaro cactuses being destroyed to build the border wall. Saguaros are kin to the autumn, plants that participate in the people's spiritual practices, like Christianity's bread and wine. Saguaro fruits are used to ferment a sacramental wine for rain-bringing ceremonies that maintain the harmony between humans and nature. On border wall construction, Sites, autumn people witnessed the destruction of thousands of saguaros. Women wept as they saw mutilated cactuses, which were hundreds of years old, piled in windrows within 60 feet of the borderlands. 
Gary Paul Nabhan wrote, a woman whispered to me, shocked, as she stood over carcasses of bulldozed saguaro, saguaro cacti. They are destroying our ancestors. For what? It's difficult to see beyond one's worldview, but it is necessary to try if we're to stand a chance of seeing beyond the blinders of the dominant paradigm that is destroying the planet. Fernando Martinez, a South American colleague of mine in Arizona, told me of his visit to what he called the birth area of both the Amazon and Magdalena rivers in the Colombian Andes. He found there a full inversion of the way we structure life. He told me that for them at the start, all was human and of one nature. Subsequently, we became separate in our natures, and stories as to why that happened varied by tribe, but all living things kept their essential human nature. Thus, for the Arawati, for example, all living things, especially predators, like us, feel exactly as we do. They are human. To jaguars, our external appearance is just an envelope, a skin that covers our identical common essence. Only shamans can break that barrier and stare with the eyes of predator humans. That is why the disappeared San Agustin culture developed what Fernando called stupefying sculptures that combine predators and humans. Four. The movement for establishing legal rights for the more than human world marks a shift from viewing the land and its creatures through the lens of extraction to one of protection. But our track record in protecting human persons from harm leaves a great deal to be desired. The border wall endangers migrants also who are leaving desperate circumstances in Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador to seek ever more remote areas to cross the border and to accept ever more risky transactions from coyotes who promise to take them to safety, but take only their money and leave them to die. One of the worst tragedies happened just this summer in San Antonio when 53 migrants were left to die trapped in a tractor trailer truck without air conditioning. Official government policies are used to weaponize the desert in enforcing inhumane border politics. Should we really put our faith in the concept of legal personhood when we fall so short, even in the humane treatment of human persons? I've wobbled on my affection for the idea of personhood when anti-rights polemicists uh, begin to speak of the personhood of the fetus. I believe strongly that whenever you believe uterine life begins, the woman who owns that uterus has the right to determine what to do about it. It's a trick of the extremist to twist language into knots that constrain the truth. Liberty, freedom, patriotism, personhood, these words all need to be untied from the tangle of falsehoods that drives anti-democratic extremism. Rhetorical flourishes may grab emotions, but they do not equal legal rights. Although just this week or last week, Georgia law has <laughs> claims that a woman can deduct her fertilized egg on her income tax as a, as a person. I can't imagine that's going to stand, but hey, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> There's a place for outrage at these violations of human rights. That place is at the ballot box, a, an ultra conservative, as ultra conservative Kansas just demonstrated in standing up to vote for reproductive justice. And I suppose that place for outrage too is here on the page where a little healthy venting may keep me from swing, sinking into the swamp of despair. So yes, we should put our faith in legal personhood because it is a concept that the legal system understands. Hello, Citizens United. If official policy is a source of systemic racism and environmental degradation, we need, a place, we need to place at least a few of our best athletes on the teams that speak legalese. Five, what is ecology? Ecology is the shining, mucky, fibrous, bloody, breathing, blossoming, pollinating, urinating, defecating, copulating, germinating, masticating, chemically communicating truth that everything is connected in the Earth household. Life didn't take over the globe by combat, Lynn Margulis and Carl Sagan wrote in 1986, but by networking. Take trees. 
Now that we know trees are central characters in the human drama, we may be ready to take them seriously as more than scenery, wall studs, and firewood. Trees make the oxygen we breathe, consume carbon we excrete. Trees warp time in their slow sentience. Trees are social beings. They connect through roots and rhizomes to nourish one another underground. Trees are silent communicators. They give one another chemical signals when a parasite threatens. Trees are home, hostel, way station, Airbnb for countless species of birds, insects, mammals, mosses, lichens, fungi. Even the tree canopy, as biologist Nalini Nadkarni has explored, provides shelter for a stunning array of organisms that find the high life quite hospitable. A tree is a household. Trees shelter and shade us. In renovating my 1864 cottage on Grand Manan Island, we got, when we got down to the studs, we found that the house wrap shielding our walls from winter storms was birch bark, a house built at the time when the only building supply store was the woods behind the building site. In the city, trees provide visual comfort from the clang of urban life. Trees educate the soul. To be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul, writes C.D. Wright in Casting Deep Shade, her slow amble in the company of beech trees. Trees come to us in poems as elegy and invocation, as in Merwin's elegy to a walnut tree, or as social convener and vehicle for gratitude as Ross Gay's transcendent to the fig tree on Ninth and Christian, a poem set in Philadelphia, a city like most, which has murdered its own people. Merwin's poem, Place, has become a kind of anthem of hope for the early Anthropocene. On the last day of the world, I would want to plant a tree. But I think it is not hope that this poem celebrates, so much as the act of lyric attention. The poem continues, what for, not the fruit, I want the tree that stands in the earth for the first time with the sun already going down and the water touching its roots in the earth full of the dead and the clouds passing one by one over its leaves. I feel in Merwin's words the imperative to cherish even the tree that has no future, the imperative to recast human desire, I want the tree, as an instrument not of acquisition but of nurture and aesthetic regard. Ecology is the humpback whale that depends upon the herring, that depends upon the zooplankton, that depends upon the phytoplankton, that depends upon the sun. Ecology is the microbiome that is me, the 50% of the DNA in my body that is not me. Ecology is the stretch of the Ganges running clean enough to drink after the COVID epidemic shut down factories along its watershed. Ecology is the six-point mule deer buck who came down from the Catalina Mountains when the Bighorn Fire destroyed its home. The invader who left my garden wall, who leapt my garden wall to drink from my bird bath and steal the Swiss chard and lettuce I was growing in ceramic pots. Ecology is my forgiveness of this theft. <laughs> Just barely. <laughs> Ecology is a kind of prayer that the delicate fibers that connect all living beings on this astonishing planet will hold. If Earth is a self-regulating organism, as Lynn Margulis and James Lovelock posit in their Gaia hypothesis, then ecology is its language, one which we are only beginning to speak. Oh, we've been faking it pretty well with our technology and games, but the Earth is tired of hearing our bullshit. So, with the pandemic, she grounded us. And with wildfires, floods, droughts, and storms, she is demanding that we listen for a change. Six, what is justice? Justice is George Floyd's murderer going to prison. Justice is his never having been killed. Justice is being a kid who can go out to buy some Skittles without being shot in the street. Justice is being a kid who can go to school without being tra traumatized by active shooter drills. Justice is evidence-based. Justice is a virtue. Justice is what makes possible the pursuit of happiness. Children understand justice from a very early age, but it's not fair. And how many times have you heard an adult say, 
Who said it was going to be fair? Well, they expect it to be fair. There's something beautiful in them. <laughs> Justice is a set of balance scales. On one weighing pan sits the right, meant to balance the wrong, that sits on the opposing weighing pan. Justice is about la law and order, our favorite TV show franchise. Justice in 21st Century America is also an online clothing store that sells girls' leggings, bikinis, and dresses for tweens and teens. Its logo has a pink twinkly heart in place of the eye in Justice. My most generous take on this is that some marketing firm has determined the appetite for justice among teen girls today is as great as their appetite for new clothes. The website has a few articles made from recycled materials and boasts stick-on tattoos promoting children's mental health. Mostly, the website is all about selling stuff to kids, which is precisely what justice is meant not to be, not one more commodity on sale to big spenders. If the virtue of justice appeals to human appetite, it is meant not to be the appetite for more belongings, but rather for a sense of belonging that might come from knowing one will be treated fairly by one's society. Robert Bullard, who founded the environmental justice field in 1978, takes heart in the Black Lives Movement that really was catalyzed after um, the, the murder of George Floyd. He is, when he and his wife moved to Houston, they learned that all five landfills in the city were in black neighborhoods. 80% of all solid waste was dumped in black neighborhoods, though black people made up only 25% of the population. They filed a suit. It lost. Bullard understood that the civil rights movement that spurred the Civil Rights Act of 1964 had focused on housing and job discrimination. He understood that environmental organi organizations at that time were run by white, college-educated, affluent males. The environment to them meant outdoors. Neither the civil rights movement nor the environmental movement saw the other's cause as their fight. Environmental justice did not yet exist. Bauer dedicated his life writing some 14 books on the subject and most recently launching a justice network, a national coalition forming in response to toxic threats against black communities in the Gulf Coast of Louisiana and West Harlem. No one has written more lyrically and inclusively about justice recently than Lacey Johnson in her brilliant essay, which my workshop participants are going to be reading, Make Way for Joy. She writes, I think justice means that I work together with others for our mutual joy. It means rejoicing in the joy of another, fostering the lives and good fortune of everyone, not only the people we consider our own. Justice means we value the lives of everyone equally and protect and support them equally. It means we recognize and protect what is radical and unique about every single person, even those who cannot return this recognition. Justice means that children are allowed to be children and then to enter adulthood with safe passage at their own pace and in their own way. Justice means we pass responsibility for keeping peace from one generation to another that we return our children from war and teach them to put down their guns. It means we never pick them up again, not ever. It means we teach everyone from birth that they are capable of nurturing, of healing, of compassion, of love. Seven, what are we doing wrong? Asks Karen O'Brien, professor of sociology and human geography at the University of Oslo, who studies climate and society. What do we do now? How do we transform governance? She takes seriously the concept of transformation, deep change, like caterpillar to butterfly, an ordinary biological process, like throwing charred seeds on the ground in June and wading through knee-high elephant ear charred leaves in July. Ordinary biology and utterly miraculous. O'Brien breaks down systemic change into spheres of influence from practical to political to personal. And in this latter category, she places beliefs, values, worldviews, paradigms, and says this is where the potential lies to spur the greatest change. No surprise there. It's easy to see that the dominant paradigm of uncontrolled growth, extractive technology, inequity, and fossil fuel addiction is failing us. And our co-beings are leaving the earth in cascading extinctions. 
This isn't an environmental crisis, O'Brien says, it's a relational crisis. It's all about the state of being connected. It's all about decolonizing the mind from binaries, moving forward with singular purpose without any certainty of the outcome. Sounds like art, sounds like evolution. Quantum physics says that underlying reality is entanglement. Quantum consciousness is nonlinear and nonlocal. To understand our capacity for change, we need to see ourselves, she says, as waves of quantum potential. As a poet, I find it pleasing to think that a metaphor could change the world. As a pragmatic 10th generation New Englander, I'm not so sure. But I do know that sudden profound change is possible. When the pandemic hit, the world changed. Factories closed, people stopped flying and driving, they stayed home. Los Angeles had decent quality air, carbon emissions dropped, rivers got cleaner. Surprisingly, and counter to the predictions of many thought leaders, as Amitav Ghosh writes, it was not the poor and weaker na nations that were seized with unrest and violence, but rather the heartland of the US, where posse-like mobs armed, this is the wonderful Ghosh, with, armed with automatic weapons and bedecked with fascist paraphernalia besieged state capitals, where large numbers of people refused to comply with lockdowns, where doctors and experts were derided, where violence against people of color continued apace. The climate smart changes didn't last, but if the perception of risk can lead to such sudden global transformation, well, waves of quantum potential, indeed. Eight, what is the role of art in times of extremity? What can we learn from artists and writers who have lived in times of extremity? How did they endure oppression and suffering? And how was their art fueled by those very conditions? Italo Calvino, in his essay, Right and Wrong Political Uses of Literature, speaks of aspects, situations, and languages, both of the outer world and the inner world, the tendencies repressed both in individuals and society. Literature is like an ear that can hear things beyond the understanding of the language of politics. It is an eye that can see beyond the color spectrum perceived by politics. Nine. I taught for several summers in the Prague summer seminars among writers who had survived both Nazi and Soviet occupations of what was then Czechoslovakia. Novelist Arnošt Lustig was sent to Auschwitz as a teenager. He survived after six years of captivity by leaping from a train and running into the woods. Before Auschwitz, he told us, I was a journalist. That felt superficial. I could go deeper with fiction. Fiction is more truthful than reporting. The camps killed 10,000 people by day and 10,000 people by night. Six years in that atmosphere. Journalism only gets one dimension, while literature has three. He wrote books of documentary art and radical acts of forgiveness that seem almost unthinkable to us with our relative freedom of speech, assembly, and movement. In his novel, Lovely Green Eyes, a 15-year-old Jewish girl sent to Auschwitz passes herself as Aryan and works in a field brothel servicing Nazi officers rather than die in the gas chamber. Her loathing for the men who visit her there keeps her alive. What happens when the war ends and she meets one of the men in civilian life? Ivan Klima, the next generation of Czech writers, described 20 years of Soviet occupation 400 writers were banned entirely. Only second and third rate writers who towed the communist line were allowed to publish. He started the Samizdat movement along with Václav Havel, Yuzhi Kolar, and others. Klima organized readings once a month. Someone would read something they'd been unable to publish. The only way to publish was to make copies on a typewriter. To use any method, other method, you risked imprisonment. To be legal, the work had to be signed. Then, when the writer was interrogated, as they routinely were, they'd say, it's my own copy, see? Here's my signature. Ludwig Vasilik wrote humorously about such conversations in a cup of coffee with my interrogator. Meanwhile, using electric typewriters and carbon paper, the writers would make 13 or 14 copies of a book in a month, the last copies unreadable with a carbon smudge. With a manual typewriter, you could do six or seven good carbons. Typists were unknown people. 
One woman was arrested for it and spent six years in jail. One main typist was persecuted, interrogated, accused of being a prostitute. She typed 10 hours a day and made no mistakes, fewer than the printed books. They sold the books for the price of paper and binding, not one crown for the author. Writers earned their money as janitors or taxi drivers. They were not allowed to work in offices or publishing houses. Within a couple of years, they'd have 10 or 20 titles and copies circulating. They would have uh, 10 or 20 titles in copies circulating among hundreds of readers. They'd ask anyone who read the book to make one more and pass it on. It was the only way to meet real literature, Klimas said, a free way of thinking. The hunger for it was greater than it is today. They also published magazines, Heidegger, published work by Heidegger, Eliade, Solzhenitsyn. It was obligatory for each person to bring something each month to the meetings, no longer than 15 pages. Each issue had a guest, 40 or 50 page, pages from a novel. They put the magazine together on the spot, then smuggled it out of the country. The Postal Service was controlled by ambassadors in American, British, Swiss, and Canadian embassies. The manuscript was taken to publishing houses in these countries, printed, then smuggled back to Czechoslovakia. Sami's Dot is not political literature. Some political essays attacked the regime, but these had to be written anonymously. Klima described this as such a wonderful time for friendships among Czech intelligentsia. And number 10. I started with a bird, so I will end with a bird. I recently visited Kent Island, a mile-long strip of rock and grass and forest that lies about a half hour sail from Grand Manan in the Bay of Fundy. Since 1936, it has been a scientific research site managed by Bowdoin College. Among the species researchers study there are leeches, storm petrels, who nest there in the summer. They dig forest burrows where they lay their eggs, the parents taking turns to fly off as far as Cape Cod or the Grand Banks for forage, to forage for krill, then return to feed the chick, a journey of about 500 kilometers. When my own feelings of quantum potential become inaccessible to me, <laughs> I go to nature for courage. I go to nature to be taken out of myself and into the gigantic mystery of which I am a minuscule part, and somehow this enlarges my spirit. The petrol study has been going on on, in Kent, on Kent Island since 1954. It's the second longest continuous scientific study of a species anywhere in the world. I've brought MFA students here along with Graham and Ann High School students. I've seen face after face turn from their screens and light up with a spirit of astonishment encountering these birds. We follow researchers into the spruce woods and help grub for petrels. About 75 nesting sites are marked for study among 25,000 or so on this tiny island. That's 25,000 pairs. To grub for a petrel, you have to sink your arm in the dirt right up to your shoulder and be lying on the ground, making your arm as long as it can possibly be, to follow the burrow to the bird. Retrieve it by the beak so you don't hurt its wings. Hold it with bird bander's grip, two forefingers embracing the neck, the body nestled in the palm. The bird is sooty gray, feathers so soft they feel like fur, little jewels for eyes, black beak, and a tube on its nose to extrude salt. This means it can drink seawater all day and never suffer, which is a good thing because petrels are pelagic birds, meaning they live at sea, except during their breeding time when they need the land. They don't understand the land. At night, they stagger around in the woods, but they need it. Most of the year, they're flying at sea. When they leave the Canadian Maritimes, they cross the Atlantic Ocean to winter along the coast of South Africa. <laughs> the birds are banded, weighed, measured, egg noted, hatch noted, fledgling noted. We understand a lot about this bird. One parent will sit with the hatchling while the other goes to sea and loads up with oil, krill and such to bring home to feed the chick. Then they swap and the other partner goes to sea. They do this until the chick is so fat it can hardly move. Then the parents leave. The fledgling emerges from the burrow, figures out it has wings, and takes off for the sea to begin the whole migratory dance it was born for. The parents will be long gone by this time, but will return to the same nest next spring. No one is sure where the chick goes. And yes, the species is in decline, but I do not want to leave you with any more stultifying data than your day is likely to present you with. 
I want to leave you with what every artist lives for, experiential data. After you hold a petrol in your palm <clears throat> to gather data and then return it to its burrow, a scent remains on your fingers that will last as long as you can resist washing your hands. This is a long, a long, long time for me. And yes, there's avian flu here, so we use sanitized gel, moving from bird to bird. But the scent can transport you. Musk, earth, resin, almost like creosote bush in the desert after rain, but gentler. <coughs> a chemist could tell me if there's any relationship between the oil on a petrol's feathers and the oil in a creosote bush. The sensation of that scent is transporting. It takes me into a reverie of love and admiration for the brilliant inventiveness of this gorgeous planet. It's just a little bird on a little island with a little bit of scent on its feathers. How else can I remind you of your gentleness? Thank you. to take any questions. Our comments or whatever. <laughs> Who's ever seen or held a petrol? I'm looking at you, Liz Bradfield. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's just, it's just, it's too much. It's, it's so other, it's such an other life, but it is so delicate and it is so beautiful and it's not pretty beautiful like a flower. It's complex in a way you have to say, what is going on here? My God, the world is beautiful and complicated. Yes. Uh, Liz, do you want to? No, no, I don't know anything about petrels uh, here at all, what they do here. We have not talked about European swan petrels, although they're very pretty birds, but they're, they're thought to be the souls of sailors who were dying at sea, and they're better at reading water. They chant water, and they almost look like a walking animal. Uh -huh. One of their nicknames is the sea lion, yep. and they stir up little currents of tension. And they're, they're the most amazing little birds, because they're the European swan petrels, they nest on an island not up north. No, they're in the south. They're, that's the sort south. of the reverse. Yeah. Yeah. And so they fly all the way up here from the tip of South America to South Africa, these little fluttery, butterfly, robin-like birds. And they're common. I mean, we're seeing them right now in harbors, which is a kind of weird when you can see them. And that's why I hope you all don't go out while you're here and just look at the water and think they're very pretty. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yes, but that's how they are most of the year. But when they, they have to lay their eggs on land, so I don't know where they're nesting here, they have, if they have the forest burrowing um, behavior. But, I mean, they, they have a little webbed um, foot, and there's a tiny little, I mean, it's smaller than a cat's claw on each one of the points. And, they, and these burrows are, you know, they're this wide, and then sometimes you can't even reach with an arm to the end of them. So, and they do return to the same nest. The pairs will return to that same nest. But um, most of the year, yeah, you, 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 and you wouldn't, you wouldn't even know they were there if you didn't know this, there was a scientific study going on and say, oh, there's a little, oh, there must be a mouse or a muskrat or something. It, it, you know, it's, yeah. Anything else? I think there's food or refreshment for us. <laughs> <laughs>